Sea Keeping. Hello everybody, I am Nick the Naval Architect. I had the opportunity to give a presentation to the Pakistan Naval Engineering College. No fancy math, just a simple overview of the science, structure, and process of sea keeping. I've then taken that video lecture and broken it up into several easy to digest YouTube videos. So let's dive into the subject of sea keeping. What to do when you don't like the answer? And if the ship motions are too rough, how do we control them? How do we alter the results? In part four of our video series, we're going to address motion control, the strategies, the mechanisms available, and what is your overall goal? I've talked about uh, the two halves of sea keeping. We've got our input, which is describing our ocean climate, and then we have the modification to that, our fluid structure interaction. And that com combines to give us our output of our ship motions. But like I said, most people turn to sea keeping because they want to improve those motions. They want to improve the situation. And that's where we get into the subject of motion control. So the question becomes, I've got an answer for my sea keeping analysis, how can I do better? When we're talking about motion control, generally we have to think of uh, the different effects and the different types of forces. So if you look at this uh, table at the top, we've got spring forces, dampers, masses, and an independent force. And the question is, I can create physical effects that will increase one of these, and if that does, how is that going to interact with all of the elements of my sea keeping? One of the biggest questions we ask is how is that going to change our resonant frequency? So for example, if I were to increase my spring forces, that would increase the resonant frequency of my ship. And that might be a very good thing because in general, if we're trying to improve, improve ship motions, the first strategy that I will use is try to shift my resonant frequency, move it away from whatever my waves are. But sometimes you can't shift it enough. So then we have to look at our second strategy, which is to reduce the amplitude of our response. So we would go up here to our different forces and say, okay, how can we actually reduce our amplitude? Which things will actually reduce our response amplitude? And you might say, well, I probably don't want to increase my mass too much because that might increase my response amplitude. So that's the second strategy. And again, you're going to look at all of these different components to pick your best option. Generally, your strategy is you're going to use some combination of a damper component and a mass component. And in just a second, I'm going to talk about what can you actually do to create damping and mass. Before you do any type of motion control, you have to look at this table and this idea and ask yourself, which element am I trying to change? So for example, um, motion sickness is most often affected by the acceleration of the ship. So we're gonna look at this row and say, okay, which elements can do a lot to decrease the acceleration? Well, then I might actually want to increase my mass because even if my ship rolls more from side to side, if that's a slower roll motion, that could actually improve um, and reduce the amount of motion sickness. Motion control is not a simple thing. And the very first problem of any motion control is you have to describe what is your goal. Then once we know our goal, we can break that down in terms of um, different methods. So I mentioned in this table, we've got a spring component, damper, and a mass, and even an independent force. Well, that's talking in terms of physics what are the actual physical components that can create that? So if we first look at spring components, well, what would be considered something that's reacting to translation? Well, first off, hydrostatics. The shape of the ship's hull is the biggest component when we're talking our spring components. So you can alter your ship's hull or you can switch the hull type. Anybody that's been out at sea knows that there's a big difference in behavior of a monohull versus a catamaran. That's your hydrostatic component. That's your spring forces altering your sea keeping. Some other things that people don't think of initially, 
an anchor cable or a mooring line. Uh, those all provide a varying force output depending upon how the ship is moving. As you can think of a ship trying to pull away from a dock, your mooring lines get tighter. They provide more of a restraining force. Another one that I like to describe that's not always intuitive is a deep keel. If you have a heavy weight positioned far below the ship, imagine the ship rolling to one side. That's going to raise the weight higher and it's going to provide a reaction force trying to pull the ship back to a level keel. Then we have on the velocity side, damping. Damping is a big thing when we're talking about motion control. Um, very often we will use damping components. And that's because they can have a limited interaction on the rest of the ship's uh, design. So damping is very nice because you don't have to worry too much about how that's going to change the rest of your ship. A great example is a bilge keel. Bilge keels are um, little plates that just stick out from the side of the ship's hull. And just simply that plate, as the ship rolls, the water has to interact with that plate sticking out from the hull. That can do amazing things to reduce your roll motion. And that's because it's providing a strong damping component. Another example, um, this is one that I found in, old, in an older paper dealing with catamarans is a sea keeping hydrofoil. Again, we have a plate stretched between two hulls on a catamaran that provides a huge damping component. Skegs are another example of a damping component. All of these are things where we're talking about that hydrodynamic effect. We're getting the water to produce an additional reaction and slow down our ship's motions. And it doesn't always have to be water. Uh, sails are another example of a damping component. If you think of a traditional sailing vessel with a 100 meter tall mast, massive sails all across that, those sails rolling from side to side, interacting with the air, that's a very large damping component. And that's still fluid structure interaction. We're talking about the interaction of our ship with the air this time. So it's all part of the same science, though I will say, Generally, we use uh, underwater components because the water is a lot denser and we get a lot more return for our effort. We also have acceleration components. One of my favorites when we're looking at ways to add mass to the ship, ballast tanks. These are, I, I love these. They are simple, they are cheap uh, compared to some of the other components. Passive gyros would be another example. Um, you don't see passive gyros anymore generally. But they were once tried, and the idea was to add a lot of moment of inertia to the ship to reduce roll motions. I, I also include damper plates here in the acceleration because I wanted to point out that you'll see damper plates in both the velocity component and the acceleration component. And that's to mention that a lot of your physical devices, their effect is not isolated to just one type of force. Uh, they actually have multiple force components to them. Another fun example is acceleration tanks. So you can create tanks with a very specific shape in your hull. Um, for example, a U shape or a flume tank, where if you fill them to a very specific level, you can get the motion of the, of the water in that tank to operate out of phase with the ship. So that when the ship rolls to starboard, the water in this tank is shifting to the port side. It's acting opposite of the ship to try and counterbalance it. And that's another example of a mass motion control option. And you'll notice that I'm talking about a lot of these in terms of roll. Uh, the roll motion of the ship is actually one of the biggest motions we worry about. And that's not to say that the other five motions are not important. It's just people are more sensitive to roll motion. And we do actually care about the crew on the ship when we're talking about sea keeping. Talking about uh, people on the ship, uh, remember how I mentioned cruise ships, they will use active control fins. This is where we actually have little miniature airplane wings sticking out from the hull. And this is pretty complicated now. You actually have a computer driving this. You have hydraulics um, changing their angle of attack and altering how they provide a reactive force. So that's one of the biggest things when we say active force in terms of motion control. Generally, there's a computer somewhere controlling things. Another example is a voice propeller. 
this is a type of propulsion system that can very quickly alter the direction of propulsion. And based upon that, you can actually have it give little pulses to the um, port and starboard side to try and counteract any roll motions. Now, I also mentioned that we had passive gyros on the mass side. Uh, there are also active gyros where we have a spinning mass and we're actually changing the orientation of that mass to provide a reaction component. So these are all sorts of different elements for motion control and they all have different cost components. And we're not done actually. Some of the more exotic methods that you can do for motion control is we have multi-body connections. Classic example is an articulated tug barge where you would have a tug that is independent from a barge, but then it links up to that barge with um, pins. And these are very large structures. Uh, the pins are basically two heavy steel structures about two meters in diameter each pin, and they're strong enough to almost completely pick up the tug. So it's a very strong coupling. And what that does is it now means that the tug and barge share the same motions. I will say that multi-body connections, I've done a fair amount of work on that area. If you're trying to look at that for sea keeping, uh, it's not for the faint of heart. Multi-body connections can be a very complicated problem with very unpredictable results. They can also be very powerful. Sometimes though, the simpler solution is to just isolate our equipment from the ship motions, which is where we get into motion compensation. If we need to control the motions for say, just a specific component on the ship, then we can actually use a computer to measure the ship motions and then we use some hydraulics to create the exact opposite motion on our component. Now that's power intensive and that's expensive, but sometimes it's really neat. Here's an example of what I talked about for motion isolation. This is what we would call a walk to work vessel where you have a ship that is trying to transfer personnel to some sort of fixed structure out at sea. Wind farm maintenance is a big case where we're starting to see this. And what I want you to notice is if you look at the left side of this gangway, the left side will not move while everything connected to the ship on the right side does move. Now that's not a passive interaction. Um, there are hydraulics controlling every component of that gameway, and it's actually, there's a computer providing an exact opposite reaction. What you're looking at here is another walk to work gameway. Uh, it's the same way to achieve the, or it's a different way to achieve the same effect. What you're seeing here on the bottom, this arrangement of six hydraulic cylinders, uh, that's what we would call a hexapod arrangement. And basically when you configure the cylinders in this arrangement, uh, it means that with these six hydraulic cylinders, you can recreate any one of the six degrees of freedom motion. So with those six hydraulics, we can completely compensate for ship motions. Dif like I said, it's a different strategy to solve the same problem. And here's another example too, where they're looking at ways to interact with smaller vessels as well. So that's an example of motion isolation is a walk to work vessel. And I will say they're pretty neat. They're, they are definitely fun to look at. They are also power intensive and extremely expensive. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to click that like button and subscribe for more videos. And did you know that we produce more than just videos at DMS? Check out our website to find more articles, free downloads, and other help with ship design. We offer a host of engineering services for budgets large and small. So check us out to see if we can make your next project easier.